welcome on the first session today uh, that will be devoted to ablation of VT again. Um, unfortunately, Carlo Papone couldn't attend, uh, but he will uh, give his talk online at the end of this session, and uh, he will be replaced by Massimo Grimaldi uh, as a co-chair. Um, and I think uh, I would like to invite the uh, first speaker, who is Frederick Sacher from Bordeaux. And the title of his presentation is Image Guided VT Ablation. Please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's really an honor for me to be here in such a great meeting with such faculties. Um, so I've been asked to talk about image guided VT ablation. So yesterday you, you may have had my colleague Hubert Cochet, uh, who talk of imaging in general. So I will focus today more on the really uh, EP part of the image guided. Um, how do I do that? Yeah. So these are my relationships with the industry. Um, so when we talk about image for imaging for VT ablation and to, more particularly to guide ablation, there are different uh, modalities. Uh, the two main are CT scan and MRI, uh, but we can uh, imagine also MIBG or any kind of imaging. And I will say a word at the end on that, especially with the photo counting uh, CT scan coming soon, which may um, change the game. Um, on CT scan, we, we, we did work a lot on CT scan and, and more particularly on wall thickness heterogeneity, and I will spend more time on this point but it has been also um, described uh, e uh, imaging to guide VT ablation based on MRI and signal intensity heterogeneity to try and, and the idea in both are the same is to try to imagine where uh, the, the channels of the different VT can be and how to target them. Um, so there, is, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages on both modalities, uh, CT scan uh, or MRI. Of course, MRIs, the, the main in, uh, interest is the absence of X-ray of your radiation, and it's pretty great to, for scar identification. However, the spatial resolution is poor, uh, which is a main disadvantage. Um, plus, uh, acquisition of sequences. Um, if you had MRI from Siemens, it's not the same as from another company, uh, so it makes things a bit uh, complicated uh, to get um, things done in different labs depending on your, on your, on your system and you, you cannot go easily uh, from one to the others. The CT scan uh, um, are, are great in terms of spatial resolution, even if it can always be better. Uh, the ad, uh, acquisition sequences are identical, whatever is the company. So if you got a, a Philips a CT scan, you will uh, have the same acquisition protocol than on Siemens one, for example. Uh, and um, the and in patient with ICD, it's, it's much easier in term, especially in terms of quality of images. And, and finally, um, the the size of CT scan was thought to be scar identification, but now we got late uh, contrast sequences, late acquisition, which uh, is a surrogate to daily enhancement and MRI, so you can have information also uh, on scar, uh, not just based on wall thickness. And actually, uh, the best is probably to merge both, and you can do if you have both, uh, you can merge information from MRI and CT scan, uh, the, the special resolution in terms of anatomy, um, a coronary artery system, or whatever, uh, on the, of the CT scan with the scar identification or MRI, and this is, uh, uh, this is probably a, a best modality if you can have uh, both. Um, there have been some retrospective studies or historical studies uh, with all the limitation of these kind of things from the Barcelona group and, uh, and ours, uh, ours, but also other groups in the Netherlands too, uh, showing that image integration is interesting, uh, seems to, bet, to get associated with a fewer vitro recurrence or at least best outcome, but all of that was were retrospective study and not randomized controlled trials. So basically, the workflow is to, uh, and, and the one we are wor uh, on which we are working in Bordeaux is to get any kind of images, uh, depending on what you have, CT scan, but also we can imagine body surface mapping, MRI, MIBG, or whatever uh, kind of images you have, um, and, and we develop softwares to translate that uh, for color coding, and that can be implemented in, a, in our any kind of 3D mapping systems, and then you will navigate 
within these images. Um, and um, what you have when you do an electron map is this kind of things when you got voltage map. So it's, it looks homogeneous, but it's not homogeneous. And this is the example of wall thickness map. So basically what is map is dark red being one millimeter thickness. Lighter red is two millimeter, and like that until five millimeters wall thickness. And we, what we will look at is wall thickness heterogeneity. And you see, this is the exact patient. Uh, when you do the mapping, it looks all red, less than 0.5 uh, millivolt in terms of electron chemical mapping, but uh, it's not homogeneous. We all know that because signals are not the same in the different part of the scar, but then uh, you will have, sometimes it can be buried, the lava, lead potential, whatever you want to call them, can be buried in. You sometimes have to paste to unmask them, and it's not so, so easy to identify what is the right spot to go and how to define and how to target the substrate. Um, the best thing is to look at the literature with different strategy depending on centers, even though at the end they are all mixing more or less the same kind of, uh, of, uh, of tips to, to get the, uh, substrate identification. But um, our uh, hypothesis was that this wall thickness heterogeneity was uh, pretty uh, predictive of uh, true uh, isthmus uh, for um, um, conducting uh, VT, uh, VT circuit. So um, in, in practice, the, the first step after having get the CT scan treated with the software is to get a good merge. That's a key point uh, because if the merge is not good, you can do whatever you want, but you won't be at the right spot. So th that's the first point. Then we go for CT smooth ablation and then at the end we, we try induction. If it's not inducible, we stop the procedure. If it's, the patient is still inducible, we'll go for further mapping and ablation. Um, so, yeah. Can I play on it? Start the video. Yep. Uh, so the, mer the merging is an important part. If you go retrograde aortic, it's pretty easy. Actually, you take the aortic arch and, and it makes pretty well the job. If you go transeptal, uh, then things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, L LA or right atrium are not, uh, not very good because they are not moving the same way as the ventricle. So for merging, it's not uh, ideal. So when we go transeptal, we take the uh, uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary artery bifurcation and uh, coronary sinus. It gives us a different landmark in the three dimension to, to, to get a good merge. And once the, the, you merge with that, we go on the left side and, and uh, with the ablation catheter, you go at the LV apex and then anterior, inferior, lateral, septal, just to make sure the merge is good. And if it's not perfectly good, you refine it. So it looks a little bit reverberative, but this is a key point, actually. If you're, once again, if your merge is not good, you won't do a good job afterwards. So it's important to take the time you need to, to get this uh, merge done. Um, it works with any kind of 3D mapping system. Uh, and when the merge is okay, then you go uh, on, the, on the LV. And then after, you, you will uh, target uh, this, um, uh, this channel to start with. Um, so what I'm doing, but this can vary from one center to the other. We typically do 40 to 50 watts for 45, 60 seconds, whatever. It depends on impedance drop, signal reduction, of course, catheter position, force. Um, we can discuss that afterwards. Uh, the, the, the idea there is to get the area non-capturable uh, because sometimes it's, it's pretty difficult to make sure the block is done by pacing, just like you will block a mitralismus line, for example, uh, uh, on, on the atrial side. So the surrogate is to make sure at least this area in, in the isthmus is not capturable anymore. Um, and then, we, as I said earlier, we will test inducibility. Uh, and if it's negative, we stop there. If it's uh, positive, we go further. One interesting thing is that what we showed is approximately in one fourth, one fourth of the case in the pilot study, uh, we, we had VT inducible. Interestingly, it was pretty fast VTs. Probably that getting this isthmus seen on, on CT scan, you get the slow, let's say, uh, VT, or at least VT less than 200 bit per minute, but you still, you may still have circuits, smaller circuit, uh, faster VT on border zone, and then you will have to target them. And the way we are doing is we are uh, relying on pace mapping and then ablating the scar area uh, 
based on the, where we think the exit is to, to get rid of uh, these uh, additional uh, uh, smaller circuits. Um, this is an example of an inferior MI. Um, you, you have two things there. You have the wall thickness, once again, dark red being one millimeter, uh, up to five millimeter. Uh, and this is the late contrast acquisition uh, of the CT scan, eight minute post contrast injection, which, uh, which uh, we look at it, uh, correlate very well with uh, delay enhancement on MRI. Um, it, uh, and so you have two, uh, inform two additional information. It's particularly interesting in the, in the septum where, the signal, uh, where, where the th um, there's not so much thinning, but you still have scar. Uh, and, it's, and especially in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, it gives you uh, important information when uh, thickness is not uh, altered. So this is the way radiologists is seeing ablation, straight line. Uh, to, to cut the different path. Uh, this is the way we are doing AP, so you go where you can, but in the area at least, it's less straight. Um, and this patient, uh, we, we had to, to do quite a fair amount of RF, 37 minutes, but just an hour and a half uh, procedure time of VT ablation, eight minute X-ray. So it goes pretty, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It, uh, in my mind, simplify the work, at least at the beginning, and even with less experience, uh, it can make Makes things much easier. So, but the results uh, there have been uh, um, the results. The Barcelona team of Antonio Borrezo based on the MRI, and we had the pilot study with 42 patients, uh, and uh, um, with um, results comparable to uh, non uh, to, to VT ablation, not using uh, CT imaging in, in these cases. But uh, we have right now the randomized study uh, funded by the European Commission. Uh, in your study, in uh, in 16 centers across Europe, randomizing uh, CT guided ablation versus uh, standard ablation, and we are we are um, we have 60 patients enrolled yet, so we are we have to uh, more more time to to complete the the recruitment, and we expect to have uh, results uh, at least in uh, in one year. Um, one last uh, comment on what we can. How imaging can help. Uh, this is more research now, but the idea would be to try to um, uh, to to uh, identify by, uh, in advance where the circuit can be with simulation, and just based on, on this uh, imaging information, we try to reconstruct a simulated activation map of VT by uh, artificial pacing at different points. Uh, compared to what was really recorded uh, and mapped uh, during uh, during the procedure, so it's retrospective, but it opens even more uh, area um, to to try to for simulation and maybe a risk stratification too. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, voltage map is important, it, but it gives you a rough idea of the substrate and requires uh, for VT ablation um, quite some experience. Uh, it takes time, uh, whereas the 3D cardiac modization uh, could or should, uh, at least could guide VT ablation. Uh, we think should, but at least could so far. Um, so before ablation, imaging is important, and this was a talk of Hubert yesterday, Hubert Cochet. It ruled contraindication of a thrombus, not only uh, in, uh, in, the, in the LV, but also in the left atrial appendage. Uh, we, we had in, in, in a series we, we just published in Europace, uh, also uh, pulmonary embolism detected by CT, uh, CT, uh, um, uh, CT scan before uh, uh, before an intervention, it can help to identify the, um, uh, the area of scar, uh, whether you have to go by uh, in the septum or epicardial, it gives you a lot of information and during in ablation, so it seems to spare time, uh, limit substrate mapping, avoid complication. And probably, uh, and I think this is, uh, at least this is the way I'm seeing it, makes things more reproducible, especially in less experienced centers. And whether it may improve outcome, we are waiting for the randomized control study to, to, to say that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Frederick. We will do the discussion at the end of the session. And now it's my great pleasure to invite Joseph Katzner to have a lecture on will therapy replace hathether ablation for VT.
Okay, so go, <coughs> good morning, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed yesterday evening. But today will be uh, even better evening because we meet together. So don't miss the opportunity. So I will talk about uh, radiotherapy in VT ablation. These are my relationships. I would like to tell you that the first ever published paper on clinical use of this therapy was from Czech Republic. It was actually from Moravia, from two centers in Trinets and Ostrava, which is a radiation center, and they have CyberKnife. It was published in Kureus, and nobody probably read this paper. But then the first report, case report, was in in circulation uh, later. And this, uh, you all know, probably this paper f uh, in New England with five patients, uh, which created a lot of enthusiasm that you can do non-invasive uh, assessment of the substrate and you can do non-invasive treatment. Uh, and obviously was followed by this ENCORE VT trial, which uh, uh, showed that there is decrease of uh, there is decrease of uh, uh, therapy uh, from ICD, and there was a decrease of uh, uh, need for antiarrhythmic treatment. And these are uh, uh, data published from uh, our group, uh, actually all data from Trinets, from Moravian Center, uh, but together with us, because we joined this uh, consortium, and uh, they, they had in these first 10 patients a significant reduction of uh, therapies. But you can see here over time, there are some late uh, recurrences or, or sometimes the effect is delayed. So it's not like a treatment that would cure the patient, obviously. And there were some side effects like uh, one progression of mitral valve uh, disease and uh, one was operated and the other was not yet operated at that time. Um, they, the same center started to use uh, body surface mapping and they did six patients together with imaging and the, the radiation volume was uh, doubled when they used this strategy compared to a carton map uh, exported to, uh, to the uh, system for oncologists. And uh, one of these patients died because of esophageal and <coughs> pericardial fistula. And the other patient died of heart failure. Two patients had uh, recurrences, only one. Uh, and three had uh, uh, reablation. So uh, we, we, can, we abandoned this uh, strategy. I, I have also some arguments why it uh, should not navigate properly, because uh, we did some studies with, uh, uh, with uh, Peter van Dam from Utrecht. Uh, in patients with CRT, with body surface mapping, and we try to uh, really uh, show what is the error in localization of the leads. And it can be around one centimeter at least. And if you have one single spot for pacing, we can imagine that if you have VT in structural heart disease, where you have different, uh, uh, different uh, location of the exit, it might be even less accurate. And also, if you have a large uh, aneurysm, if you have large aneurysm, you can have like six VTs from different uh, parts of, I do nothing, some magic. Uh, you have different, uh, different exits uh, from this big aneurysm, so I don't know how uh, you will irradiate, uh, what you will irradiate uh, in this uh, case. And also, uh, also it, it can only show exit. It's like in this case, uh, it was a mappable VT. You see that in epicardially, the exit looks like uh, in the middle of right ventricular free wall. But actually, the patient had another uh, arrhythmia, which was obviously from uh, left uh, ventricle with exit in left ventricle. And finally, uh, the critical area for both arrhythmias were in the, were in the septum. So uh, it, these are my arguments why this body surface mapping together with uh, imaging may not work uh, uh, the same way like if you do uh, this kind of export of data from your mapping system, which is very precise. We developed that with a group of Katja Zeppenfeld, and, and this uh, study on the right side of the panel shows that uh, there is a very good reproducibility. We also showed in one case report that uh, it's very critical sometimes to have uh, accurate site, and this patient had previous myocardial infarction, deep substrate in uh, this area, 
and uh, we eradicate, eradicate it first uh, just based on indirect comparison of the map and CT scan and we missed this area by, by uh, you know, this narrow uh, margin uh, only when, when we exported data, uh, second occasion was uh, successful and patient lost uh, VTs after three months. We also had uh, opportunity to study some patients after uh, radiotherapy when they died. And this patient, for instance, died uh, three months uh, after, and we we found uh, in microscopy very nicely demarcated, sorry, a demarcated uh, area of irradiation, and there there was a lot of caspase in microphages, suggesting that uh, there is apoptosis going on. Uh, after radiotherapy, and this uh, fits with the data from Mayo Clinic uh, in an experimental setting. Uh, we are now also studying uh, uh, redo cases. Uh, Peter Peichel analyzed some uh, cohort of patients. This is just one example. This was a lady with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and she had, uh, uh, as a complication of septal uh, ablation, she had also lateral wall infarction. And you see that this was a dense area before radiotherapy, and this was after radiotherapy when she had recurrences and we had to do reablation. So it really creates fibrosis and uh, apoptosis and fibrosis. And on the contrary, some people, people who published Encore VT, they, now they try to persuade us that it does not create any fibrosis necessarily and it's ablation without ablation because you can reprogram channels, ion channels. So uh, we will see. Uh, we analyzed the most recent uh, series of 17 patients uh, who had already this very precise expo uh, export of data from mapping system. They had. Uh, First, they had a unified protocol for ablation in both centers. We really did ablation, uh, repeated ablation, and when, they, when it failed, uh, we went for radiotherapy, exported data with very high accuracy. And uh, so you, you see that patients had at least two ablations before, including epicardial in 10 patients out of 17, most of them on drugs, and they were irradiated, and there was uh, relatively high all-cause mortality because of heart failure, because these patients are really very sick. And this is, uh, this is timing of catheter ablation or SBRT procedures. This is uh, this uh, procedure. And you see that before they had a different number of ablations. This is uh, SBRT, first procedure. Sometimes there was one before and uh, there are re-ablations after and this is last visit, so some patients died very early, uh, some patients had reablations. So it's not a cure for, for the patient. But what it does probably, and it looks that it decreases the number of shocks, and that's an observation from other studies. Here you see that there is decrease of ICD shocks, but there is less decrease of ATPs, which is not... A, uh, statistically significant in, in all uh, periods, but uh, uh, some, some effect is there, but uh, most of these patients had reablations after radiotherapy. So it, uh, it looks that uh, it does some fibrosis, it slows down the VT, and then you can reablate and you can be successful afterwards, but um, we still need more data. Other studies also showed some delayed effect or uh, arrhythmia recurrences. So we cannot really say that this is a cure for a patient that it will replace catheter ablation. And we are running a randomized trial, uh, which is called STAR-VT. Uh, our uh, two centers and we have some satellite centers. And the problem is to recruit patients into this trial. It's already three years. And uh, we, we have, I don't know, about 14 patients altogether now in three years, and only about 3% of patients in our institution were uh, recruited to the trial. Uh, so uh, all others had successful ablation without recurrences. There is also European, uh, large European uh, consortium, which is supported by European Commission. It's called StopStorm. And uh, this is not randomized study, it's, it's just like registry, uh, retrospective and prospective. 
But e even in this registry, there is a problem to recruit patients uh, in all different countries which are participating. And uh, on the other hand, I believe that ablation in expert center is safe and efficacious. Uh, we are right now analyzing with Dan a uh, cohort of patients. You see here 1,700 patients, uh, and most of them are structural heart disease, more than 1,000 or more than 1,100. And primary conscious sedation, uh, we had hemodynamic deterioration uh, only in 1% of cases. Pain SD score, no predictive value. If you look at uh, recurrent uh, VT requiring reablation, it's not bad over time if you take this it's in years. This is idiopathic and this is uh, structural VT. So uh, it seems to work really in experienced hands. And, uh, don't forget that there is a development of technology and we discussed uh, already uh, something about pulse field and this, uh, <coughs> this technology was yet, not yet uh, used in, uh, in ventricular myocardium but we used this uh, in a small study, we used this uh, Afera uh, Sphere 9 catheter uh, to ablate with a high energy RF and uh, in this uh, report in 12, pa sorry, 12 patients uh, we had very good success uh, in, in two centers in Prague. Uh, I think there was also one center, I don't know if Pierre Jais was there, I don't remember exactly. And this, this was quite uh, 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 interesting uh, and very successful uh, modification of the substrate. So we, we have still, uh, uh, let's say, expectation uh, to use, for instance, this technology with pulse field. And there are some data from Elat Hunter showing that uh, you can create very large lesion if you repeat pulse field. This, this is from ventricle myocardium of the, uh, of the swine. And you see that uh, with a high energy RF, you even create larger lesions with this uh, lattice tip electrode. So uh, we have still something to tell with catheter ablation. So it appears uh, that radiotherapy is modestly efficacious and rather adjunctive to catheter ablation. Long-term safety remains uh, unknown and current experience doesn't support the view that it could replace catheter ablation for VT. So these are my conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Maybe, uh, th uh, thank you, maybe we have, um, because Joseph is just leaving, uh, maybe the, if there is any single uh, burning question, we may answer just now. Boris, just very brief question, very impressive that you did 1,700 uh, VT ablations of 50 years. <clears throat> so do you see any trend there? Is that really a growing? Yeah, it's growing. Um, we have every year uh, like 20 <coughs> or, or something like this more. Uh, but we are the main center in the whole Czech Republic, so we are concentrating patients here from the whole region. We d last year we did 270 ablations and, and two-thirds were structural heart disease uh, patients. So the interventional cardiologists do not improve their... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, it, it, there is a difference in substrates. We rarely see big aneurysms like we used to see in the past. It's, it's really... But the, these patients, are, you know, they have ICD, they live 10 years, 15 years, and they come with uh, VTs uh, later on. So uh, the more ICDs you implant, the more patients uh, survive, and then, they, then you have uh, this growing number of patients. So I, I think, but the, this also suggests that uh, if you specialize in, a, in a, this kind of ablation, so you can concentrate patients, you can do every day practically the procedure. You have also options like um, mechanical support, transplantation, LVAT. So th this is, uh, I think, the way how it should be. I, I don't think that this kind of ablation should be done in less experienced centers, even having uh, some CT uh, scans, because this is not ablation that you can have one VT and you just ablate and nothing happens. It can. You can trigger storm during ablation, uh, and you have to do really something. And it's it's not for less experienced centers. This is my uh, my uh, uh, vision. I I don't care. If anybody can do AFib ablation today with tools like cryo or or pulse field, but uh, not VT. In structural heart disease, I, I would say. <laughs>
Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I, I will join uh, Katya and we will, uh, we will have live case uh, in some time. So we will see each other again. All right, it's my pleasure to invite Massimo Grimaldi, uh, who will give his talk on uh, radiotherapy as well, but not for VT, but for AF. Thank you, Dan. Dear colleagues, thanks, Joseph, for this kind invitation. So is there a room for radiotherapy for atrial fibrillation? When I started this, pro this program, I spoke with Joseph, and Joseph told me, please, be careful, because the esophagus is very close to the pulmonary vein, and we had a death after a VT ablation. This was a, a very thick patient and had, uh, I think, two or three uh, radiofrequency ablation, and then after uh, radiotherapy, had a fistula between uh, esophagus and pericardium. The trouble is, why I want to try the radioablation for atrial fibrillation? First of all, there are too many patients, and uh, these patients are growing, and uh, we are not able to cure so many patients with a, a very high class of indication, 1A, in Italy, we are performing around 6% of uh, 1A indicated ablation. And I think in Europe is not so different, around 8 9%. So we miss a lot of patients because we don't have enough labs and physicians. The other thought was about the elderly patients. Uh, we have uh, many, many patients in the waiting list. And uh, very often, over 80 years old, we don't we don't do ablation in elderly patients. In this meta-analysis, you can see that patients over 75 years and 80 years old patients have a higher risk of complication. And you can see this is statistically significant in this meta-analysis. So we don't like to treat very old patients. So the comparison between uh, catheter ablation and stereotactic uh, arrhythmia radioablation is that probably stereotactic uh, is not invasive, of course, and uh, probably is also less operator dependent. Um, somebody can tell me what about the cancer risk? The cancer risk is related to some DNA, of course, change, but it occurs uh, around 20 years after the exposure to radiation. So in our uh, study, we decided to do patients only over 70 years, 70 years old. What about the risk? The risk when you give less than five gray light as total dose, this risk is less than uh, Five is less than three per thousand. So it's very low risk and it is a risk at 20 years. The other thought was about the operator dependent. This was a patient after three AF ablation and you can see that all four pulmonary veins are conducting. Of course, not all disease operator dependent and patient dependent, but sometimes we can find this kind of uh, situation. As Joseph told you, the radioablation provokes fibrosis after a period of vocalization. And this is a very nice picture of fibrosis after radiotherapy. One very important lack of knowledge is that we don't have any dose ranging study about radioablation in, in human studies. It is not ethical, of course. We only have data from animal studies. But if you see the number, these animal studies are very small. The maximum number is 19 uh, pigs and canine and dogs, and uh, another is eight. We can see the, this both study. In this both study, they did the ablation using from 22.5 gray up to 40 grays. And uh, only we using the high energy, they had a complete absence of uh, amplitude at the EP study post radioablation. So in this study, they told that uh, we need at least 35 grays. This is uh, another study from Zay. This is uh, the, the, with the higher number of uh, animals. This is uh, 19 animals. And you can see that they tried 15, 20, 25, and 35 grays. 
uh, they had a good success only with 25 and 30, on with the using a 20 gray, uh, half of animals were not completely uh, ablated. What about human studies? Few, a, a couple of studies with uh, case series. In this Mexican, uh, from Mexico study, we have just two patients in an area without possibility of doing catheter ablation. These patients, they didn't want to go uh, in another city and they did this ablation. These two patients had relapses, one after uh, six months and another one later. This is another study. Three cancer patients with atrial fibrillation. They did pulmonary vein isolation by using uh, radiation and box lesion. This study and the previous one used a, a 90 minutes radiation. The time of radiation is very important. 90 minutes is a long time. Among these three patients, one died to, due to the cancer and two had uh, uh, some, uh, you see, some study this is a, a transesophageal recording without any potential, so it, it looks that it works. And this is the died patient, the dead patients. You see very nice uh, fibrosis. So we started our study. We started our study and we wanted to enroll 20 patients over than 70 years old with a lot of episodes, at least two episodes per week. So we found very uh, symptomatic patients. The, the primary endpoint, of course, is a safety endpoint. Evaluating especially uh, the bronchus, lung, and esophagus, of course. And secondary uh, endpoint was a, an efficacy endpoint about atrial fibrillation recurrences and long-term clinical outcomes. What about the follow-up? We studied the, the patient uh, with the ECG seven days ECG monitoring, CT scan at six months, and echocardiography. This is uh, the plan. <clears throat> the patient comes and do the, the base CT with the contrast, and uh, we also do the uh, four-dimensional CT because we look at the movements of the heart and of the esophagus, and especially of respiration. When we do the radiation, we have a respiration gating, and then we do the, uh, we find the bronchus and the esophagus because uh, we uh, want to avoid radiation of esophagus and bronchus. And when we are very close to esophagus and bronchus, the dose is reduced by from 25 to 13 gray, because it is demonstrated that 13 gray is not dangerous for this organ. And then there, there is uh, the, you see, the simulation of uh, uh, the treatment plan. We have two uh, labs for radioablation. This is used usually for cancer, mainly brain cancer, and you see it's with painted wall for these very uh, poor patients. Uh, this is uh, the motion assessment for uh, the um, respiration. This is uh, the target definition. And you see, we very well um, see the esophagus also during the procedure, procedure because the, the machine has a CT scan and looks at the esophagus and the esophagus movements. Uh, plan elaboration, 25 gray in a single dose. And this single dose long lasts three minutes. So in three minutes, we do the ablation of all four pulmonary veins. During these three minutes, we have a, a respiration-gated uh, uh, machine and the esophagus and patient movements are checked continuously. The machine gives the radiotherapy and if you have a, a movement uh, of esophagus of uh, respiration, stops immediately and then restart. What about the results? Among these 20 patients, uh, we did um, uh, interrupted uh, antiretic drug just before the at enrollment. So all these patients become off drugs. Many, they couldn't do drugs because uh, they had the sinus bradycardia or a long PICU interval. So it's very difficult patient to treat also by pharmacological uh, approach. 18 patients did the uh, STAR. One patient withdrew the con informed consent after uh, they spoke with the uh, pra uh, general practitioner. 
One patient was not treated because the esophagus was very, very close to the left pulmonary veins. Was, the distance was, uh, uh, they were too close, it was impossible to do a good treatment. So we did 18 patients. Mean age was 77, oldest was 88 years old. And these are old patients, uh, almost all had uh, hypertension and other comorbidities. Of course, they are old patients. So we have old patients, sick patients, and without drug. One patient had uh, a torsade de pointe after, but uh, we uh, did the coronary, no problem, uh, uh, nothing else, and we implanted the ICD. This patient had no more uh, atrial fibrillation, but had one more polymorphic VT in the follow-up. And the previous, the star, he had two syncope. Um, five patients had mild esophagitis, resolved after one week using uh, pr uh, proton pump inhibitors and sucral fit. Six patients had asymptomatic mild pericardial effusion after three, between three and six months from STAR. One patient had an asymptomatic, but this pericardial effusion was four millimeters, and we used colchicin just in one patient. Secondary endpoint. In the first two months, we had a lot of ectopies and uh, some atrial tachycardia. After these two months, uh, seven patients had atrial fibrillation or recurrences and, um, after four months from start. And these patients had significant reduction on, uh, anterith on uh, arrhythmias. So they had much less episodes. Two patients had uh, atrial tachycardia six months after STAR, but not AF recurrences. Nine patients are uh, atrial arrhythmias free, completely free. So we have a 50% success rate and 61 atrial fibrillation free. All patients, all patients had an improvement in uh, a quality of life uh, score because all patients had a, a very important reduction in atrial fibrillation burden. Now I want to share with you the, the map after in a recurrences patients. These are the first two patients with atrial arrhythmia recurrences, and we have here an atypical atrial flutter on the roof. And you can see that all four pulmonary veins were perfectly isolated. And in these two patients, we had a good left atrium, you see good voltage. But in these two patients, perfectly isolated the four pulmonary veins. This is a 12-month follow-up mapping. This patient had um, atrial fibrillation, but you can see uh, this patient has a, a, a very sick atrium, but all four pulmonary veins, again, are isolated. You see, all four pulmonary veins. And very interesting that the left uh, superior pulmonary veins had also some dissociated bits. So the star worked properly. Also, the right atrium was uh, uh, with a very large low voltage areas. This is the last um, mapping, 11 month follow up patient. And this patient was, um, we were not sure to treat this patient because the esophagus was very large, like esophagus acalasia, and had the bronchus very close to the superior veins. So we reduced it to uh, 13 gray, the irrigation here, here, and also on the roof. And as you can see, this is not good pulmonary vein isolated because it is too distal. And we also have uh, not isolated the, um, the carina uh, among the left pulmonary veins and, among, uh, and between uh, right pulmonary veins. So this is a poor, uh, pulmonary vein isolation for this patient. So my take home messages are that uh, right now we have one more weapon probably for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation treatment in elderly patients. For sure there is a lot, lack of knowledge on the optimal dose in men. We don't know uh, today what is the minimum dose, uh, effective dose. Probably 13 is too low, we have seen this, but just on one patient we can't tell you anything better. Long-term success and safety are unknown, and multi-center randomized trials are needed to uh, have better knowledge on this field. Thank you for your attention.
is all right. Thank you uh, for the lecture and the, uh, the discussion on this topic will follow at the end of the session and uh, I just want to ask to try to connect with Milan. Uh, Good morning to everybody. Good hello. morning, Joseph. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. The topic uh, of my presentation is completely different. Um, our topic is uh, is it possible to ablate the ventricular fibrillation or to prevent the ventricular fibrillation in cardiogenetic disease? The first question is, where are localized the cardiogenetic disease? And uh, we hypothesized that the fifth chamber of the heart, in reality, the pericardium, is uh, the most frequent localization of the cardiogenetic disease. In particular, the visceral pericardium is uh, the anatomical substrate for many of these uh, cardiogenetic conditions. And looking in detail, the fifth chamber is uh, indeed the pericardial cavity. So the smallest, the smallest component of uh, myocardium um, this, uh, this chamber is very thin and uh, is in between uh, the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. Looking at the histology, clearly we have a very, uh, very clear monolayer of mesothelial cells uh, with, uh, with a flat and cuboidal shape. And uh, important to know these cells have uh, an, a very high metabolic uh, activity. Uh, in fact, the most important uh, physiological um, uh, mechanism of the physiology of the cells are concentrated in these mesothelial cells. And uh, we have the production of very important cytokines, chemokines, uh, in interferon, so uh, the complement activation, the inflammatory activation, so are very active with a very active mitochondrial activity. The surface of these cells has the microvilles, and these microvilles are responsible for the distribution of water, electrical charges, and molecules probably the electrical charges have a very important role in constructing the signature of sudden death in this cardiogenic, cardiogenetic disease. Because the main topic of this presentation is to understand if every cardiogenetic disease has a particular localization and a specific signature identifiable and treatable to prevent uh, episode of ventricular fibrillation. But uh, before to describe the mechanism, we have to emphasize that the anatomical uh, autonomic control of the art in 80% of the case is localized on the epicardium. And the autonomic representation on the epicardium is uh, much more than in the endocardium. And you can see this is the epicardial representation of the autonomic control, and this is the endocardial representation. So this area is extremely innervated and uh, probably may explain uh, why uh, cardiogenetic condition like long QT and daily repolarization can be associated uh, with the autonomic nervous system activation. And this is uh, the geometrical configuration of the autonomic innervation, including in particular the right ventricle, but we have to admit also the left ventricle also involved, but the epicardium is uh, the very specific localization of this autonomic control. 
So in detail, uh, I will describe uh, the substrate of Brugada, early repolarization, long QT, and uh, right ventricular dysplasia. Because uh, for serendipity, during the experience in mapping and ablating uh, the Brugada substrate, we discovered that also long QT, early repolarization, and right ventricular dysplasia can show a signature of their physiopathology in the epicardium. I will go very fast in describing uh, the anatomical substrate of Brugada because you know very well the substrate is localized in the epicardium and the EKG that usually we see in the precordial lead uh, are the electrical representation of a substrate localized on the output rut and uh, the anterior wall. We know that the pattern type 1 is very dynamic, is not present uh, 24 hours a day, and also the substrate is uh, very dynamic. So this substrate is not uh, indeed related to abnormal substrate in terms of structure of the myocardium, but there is a dynamicity of the electricity of the substrate. And just to, to clearly say that the endocardium in the Brugada patient is completely normal. On the other end, the epicardium is uh, very abnormal. So this condition is localized just on the epicardial layer of the myocardium. And uh, in the past, there have been described also localization in the endocardium, but this is not our experience. So Brugada syndrome is a, an epicardial condition. So it's absolutely important to get the access in the pericardium, but you will see much better during the live procedure. In the normal condition, without cardiogenetic disease, the epicardial electrogram is very narrow and very smooth, without abnormalities. On the other hand, patient, we have uh, this uh, wide duration, low voltage or high voltage component, usually late component, and sometimes fragmentation of this component. And uh, this uh, activity, abnormal electrical activity, is not stable, but very variable. As variable is uh, the type 1 EKG in the, during the day. In this paper, we described the anatomical configuration and the morphology of the substrate. The substrate has the aspect of anion-like substrate with the center with the most uh, prolonged activity and the periphery with the less prolonged activity. So the core of the substrate uh, is uh, the most severely affected uh, part of the epicardium, and the periphery is uh, less affected uh, until it became normal at the outside of this uh, anion-like substrate. But the substrate is not only anion-like, but uh, can be different in every individual patient, and the morphology and the extension of the substrate uh, can predict uh, the type uh, of uh, uh, arrhythmogenic condition. More extensive is the substrate, more aggressive will be the ventricular fibrillation. Uh, in case the substrate is small, we have a more organized uh, ventricular tachycardia, but this is a rare condition. But in most of the cases, we have polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Important to know, if we look uh, about the independent predictor, predictor of, arrhythmogenic, uh, uh, of arrhythmogenic condition, the substrate size uh, is uh, the most uh, important parameter to predict uh, the risk of ventricular arrhythmia in the Brugada patient. Uh, this is uh, a typical EKG when the type 1 is not present. 
But if we do the map uh, in absence of type one, we see these uh, fragmentation without prolongation. And uh, if we infuse uh, Ajmalin, this substrate became more active. We provoke uh, the presence of type one and this uh, small fragmentation, not prolonged, became uh, more prolonged. And uh, we can uh, highlight this uh, region with prolongation of the activity in uh, purple color using this uh, particular software. This is very important because uh, uh, when we assess uh, the patient uh, uh, for the risk stratification is extremely important to be in presence uh, of type 1 and in presence of active, uh, active uh, substrate. And it's not the same, the outcome in patient in presence of type 1 and uh, without type 1. But let me go to an example to show how, how we approach this type of patient. This is a patient with uh, many episodes of ventricular fibrillation, family history of sudden death. At baseline, this patient has pretty normal EKG, just suspected Brugada. And uh, this is an example of ventricular fibrillation documented uh, at the ICD. And this is after Eismalin, EKG aspect. So the mapping, uh, this is in a, how we do the mapping. The, the duodeca polar is navigating on the pericardial space. You see the black dots are the region of the epicardium with the most represented fragmentation. You see this is the baseline condition, but during ice marine, you see this potential became much more prolonged and uh, the area is much wider and uh, the use of Eismalin is essential to define the substrate uh, in detail. And you can see here the results of the mapping with the prolongation of the activity and the normal activity outside of the purple area. And uh, the ablation, per piacere, poi va a parlare a bassa voce? The ablation should be performed in a very superficial way. The duration of each application is a few seconds, no more than five to 10 seconds, because the end point is not the transmural lesion, but just the superficial abolition of the abnormal activity. And uh, this is very clear because if we compare before and, uh, and after, clearly we, st we still preserve the ventricular electrogram and uh, we just eliminated the, the late potentials and the prolonged activity uh, of the baseline condition. So we do not perform any transmural lesion, just superficial abolition of the epicardial substrate. And at the end of the ablation, this is the, the, the results, the elimination of the pattern before and after Eismalin, and also four years later is uh, still uh, abolished the, the pattern type one and uh, we will see the ventricular arrhythmias in this patient, no further ventricular fibrillation episode uh, have been documented for the seven years. Just to give uh, an idea on our prospective registry and the randomized trial, uh, we enrolled, uh, for example, in the prospective registry, the most severe symptomatic patient 206, and the primary end point was uh, to see which predictors of event before radiofrequency uh, were important, and uh, what was the results after the epicardial ablation 
in terms of uh, even free survival after radiofrequency ablation. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the flow chart with the uh, inclusion of patients with cardiac arrest and malignant syncope documented uh, as uh, ventricular arrhythmias uh, syncope. Uh, and the follow-up was very consistent, about five years. This was uh, the clinical characteristics table of the study population. Uh, the patient with malignant event had uh, these uh, clinical characteristics. Uh, more, most of them had type 1, family history of sudden death, positivity to the genetics, and inducible ventricular fibrillation. And more important, the dimension of the substrate, uh, bigger in the uh, very symptomatic uh, and cardiac arrest patient. Uh, the factors associated uh, with the ventricular fibrillation was the positivity to the uh, genetics uh, and uh, the substrate sites, and this is very clear. Regarding uh, the results on the follow-up, uh, we did the reablation in only one patient, but after the reablation, it was completely ismally negative, so 100% of the patient after the ablation don't show any clinical manifestation and any electrogram aspect of uh, Brugada syndrome. Uh, this is the representation of radiofrequency outcome uh, in this population. Before the ablation, this was the situation. After the ablation, we have uh, a dramatic resolution of the clinical events. And this is the behavior of the patient in the control group without ablation. Clearly, they continue to have episodes, fortunately, with the ICD implanted. And uh, this is after the ablation. Clearly, we have a different behavior in the group ablated with the epicardial approach. This was a, a registry, but this is a randomized study, and uh, we, we are going to stop this study because the difference between ablation group and ICD group is so different that it's not ethical to continue. But uh, actually, it's very clear that Brugada is localized in the epicardium, no doubt that we can uh, ablate Brugada with this superficial lesion, but uh, very recently we contributed in the publication of a paper showing that also the long QT in the past considered a pure electrical disease indeed uh, is associated with uh, a very particular substrate. Uh, we know that in the past uh, the ventricular arrhythmias associated with long QT have been treated uh, with the ablation of the trigger or with the control of the autonomic system uh, with the ablation of ganglio stellato or with the use of a beta blocker. But we know some of these patients continue to have ventricular arrhythmia and uh, our experience was focused in particular on the patient with a recurrent episode of ventricular fibrillation, uh, even uh, during the treatment with beta blocker or other things. And the first uh, endocardial and epicardial mapping we did uh, show that in the long QT, we have a very particular reduction in the voltage of the epicardial substrate and we have uh, a very different area showing uh, region of fibrosis, uh, region of very normal tissue with voltage reduction uh, fragmented fra in between uh, region of fibrosis. And this is the epicardial aspect of the tricuspid valve in this region and the out through tract. But interesting is the type of the electrogram. In most of the cases, uh, is a double potential with uh, isoelectric line uh, in the middle. 
but let's go to the real life. This is, was the first patient uh, with uh, every other day ventricular fibrillation. This patient was very well studied and implanted a few years before for the cardiac arrest and torsade the points. Uh, this was the EKG at the admission under full dose of beta blocker. And this was one of the episodes of ventricular fibrillation patient. The endocardium, uh, blue purple, as you expert of uh, electrophysiology, is uh, the voltage map representation of this 3D mapping system. So the endocardium seems to be completely normal, but the epicardium uh, seems to be uh, abnormal with this uh, region of fibrosis uh, surrounded by region of low voltage or normal voltage. And once again, uh, the typical signature is a double potential with tesoelectric line uh, in the middle, but the signature is multi-component low voltage signal. And the localization, once again, is on the epicardial aspect of tricuspid valve and uh, out through trap. But uh, if we look outside of this region at the border between right and left ventricle, for example, is a very wild, uh, healthy uh, signal. So no signature is outside of that uh, localization. What was the approach uh, for serendipity? We just did the homogenization of this substrate with the aim to eliminate the double potential and transform the double potential in a single potential, not ablating transmurally, but very superficially. And you see before and after the ablation, the electrogram changed completely. Uh, we were very surprised that during this very limited uh, ablation, the QT was reduced from 530 to 457. But interestingly, after this approach, this patient stopped to have ventricular fibrillation and is completely asymptomatic without beta blocker. This is an extremely important experience. But this was an, an, an anecdotal case, but we went forward in uh, mapping uh, other long QT with frequent episode of ventricular fibrillation. This is uh, another long QT, really long and uh, uh, beta blocker therapy. The endocardium, uh, once again, is still very normal, but once again on the epicardium, from the tricuspid valve to the output rat, we had the same Arlecchino substrate with fibrosis surrounded by normal tissue or low voltage. And once again, the signature was similar, double potential, uh, double potential, double potential, the de homogenization, the same approach, I want to show this. This double potential is very typical and very abnormal, usually not present in the normal epicardial layer. And uh, the long QT became uh, pretty normal QT, 100 milliseconds less just after the ablation, and is uh, clearly visible on the EKG. One more patient, but we have many examples. Now we have experience on three, uh, three, uh, 30 patients. Uh, this is another localization, mainly on the output rat, on the, on the septal aspect at the border of right atrium. But once again, the signature is the same, is reproducible, repeatable, and also and also, you see, this area is more mature because we have more extensive fibrosis, detectable only with the mapping. All these patients uh, did the MRI and the CT scan that was completely normal. So if you do the MRI in this patient, 
you don't see anything of this, but it's detectable only with uh, high density map. And uh, you see the fibrosis uh, shows uh, very, very, very small potential with low voltage. And the tissue outside of this area, once again, is completely normal, healthy signal. And the homogenization got, once again, the reduction of QT prolongation. But uh, as, uh, as you had the occasion to read, this is our contribution showing that the cardiac arrest and the repetitive syncopies occurred a few years before and became very repetitive recently. And most of them had ventricular fibrillation. But the age, the age at the first episode was around 20s. But the arrhythmic storm became much more evident and repetitive at 40s, meaning that uh, the substrate of QT needs time uh, to mature. Uh, and uh, the most risky period of the life is the 40s uh, decades. And uh, 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 surprising us, all of these patients had the reduction in the QT. But this uh, slide is extremely important, showing that in the QT, the substrate can have a different uh, level of progression. And in our 30 patients, we discovered a very simple double potential substrate, more advanced substrate with uh, more detailed fragmentation, and uh, at the end, uh, we had fibrosis. And all these, uh, all these progression have been associated with a very typical genetical codification. All these patients have the typical genetic uh, mutation of uh, long QT. Uh, what we can affirm uh, is that while the Brugada syndrome as uh, a pretty normal substrate with a very dynamic activity, uh, and uh, under eyes uh, more visible, the, the substrate of long QT is uh, stable as a clear microfibrosis as a dominant aspect uh, of his uh, activity. But what is the, the relation between uh, long QT and uh, early repolarization? I have to admit that I was very surprised. This is a patient with recurrent ventricular fibrillation. This is a typical early repolarization, the documentation of ventricular fibrillation. And once again, you see the endocardium is normal, but also the early repolarization as this typical localization on the tricuspid valve is an anatomical substrate and the ismaline does not affect this type of substrate. But also the signature is uh, similar, not equal, but uh, is uh, very similar. And having, uh, and the, the tissue outside is very normal. The homogenization got <coughs> a very interesting aspect. We reduced the repolarization. It's like uh, WPW. And uh, this is very surprising that it's possible to do this in cardiogenetic disease. But we have to admit that sometimes we have very complex substrate, the combination of early repolarization and Brugada. You see the early repolarization in ABL. You see the substrate of Brugada in the anterior wall, the signature of Brugada uh, here. But also we have the signature of early repolarization in the left posterior lateral wall and left inferior lateral wall. So it's necessary to do, in this case, is the ablation of all these three substrates, anteriorly, posteriorly, and inferiorly. And this is very effective because uh, we completely eliminated uh, this overlap condition of cardiogenetic uh, disease. At the end of my presentation, my message is, most probably, 
in the pericardial cavity, we have uh, the cardiogenetic disease substrate. And these substrates are typically and specifically different. The Brugada has a, a normal anatomical substrate with a very dynamic activity sensitive to the Eichmaling. The long QT and the early depolarization have uh, a progressive uh, microfibrosis formation and uh, the signature of uh, double potentials. And uh, why not uh, in the future to treat this patient before the sudden death arrive. This is the reason of our last Congress with the title Ablating the Sudden Death, looking at the signature in the pericardial space. Thank you very much. Okay, dear colleagues, now we just have uh, uh, one question for each speaker because we are a little bit late. So, do you have any question for Frederic Sacha? Uh, no question for Frederic? Ah, okay, Boris. Please, the microphone. Oh, okay. sorry, yeah. Uh, Boris Schmidt from Frankfurt. So, uh, congratulations to the nice imaging work you do. The, the, actually, the strategy reminds me a little bit of the early work of Sujima and Bill Stevenson when they ablated in the 3D electroanatomical map short lines between the substrates, but of course in a 2D fashion because they couldn't see <laughs> very deep. Does that, like the CT, does it change your perspective? And in how many cases would you think you, you, you do a primary endo and epicardial approach given the information from the images? And maybe if you look at the failures you also had in your experience, retrospectively, were those failures because you couldn't reach the deep substrates or other reasons? Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, this is quite a large question and actually we could spend hours to discuss that because it's it's great. I mean, um, so first of all, um, yeah, it helps a lot and give us an idea of the sickness. So it helps, uh, and we are talking there about ischemic cardiomyopathy patient for this wall thickness heterogeneity. It's probably a little bit less reliable in non-ischemic where it's intramural or there's less sickness and we had other tools that let contrast all those kind of things. But co let's come back on, on sickness. Um, um, during the pilot phase, we, we, we tried to position our lesion at different place of the isthmus, uh, and at what point more at the entrance and exit in area which were not so uh, thin, and that was a problem. We had recurrence, more recurrence. So it helped us to get this information on not only where the isthmus is are potentially, but also on where we should ablate, where it's the sinus, because it's much easier uh, to go, uh, uh, to, to reach transmurality. And if I go back on your question on the OAP, for ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, um, nowadays we did a, quite a lot of this on the OAP at first procedure, but not anymore. Um, we, 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 we for is, once again, for ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, uh, if there is epicardial substrate, it's different. But for those one, we go mainly endocardial as a first procedure, and just in case of redo, we, we will go uh, epi. But we can discuss more afterwards. I guess we are running uh, short of time. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Joseph is connected by the lab. Anybody has a question for uh, Joseph? is connected, uh, they are ready for the procedure. Okay, if not, anybody has a, a question for the uh, radio ablation in atrial fibrillation? Maybe if, if there is no question from auditorium, uh, I have one question to target your Ablation to elderly population, and the problem there is that uh, frequently the, the PVs are not only the source of AF. And uh, from our uh, from our experience, uh, uh, valvular pr problem is frequently there um, when the ablation is um, focused to peri annular region, which is which could be uh, needed in some patients. 
Oh, thank you. This is a, a really a, a good point. Uh, you are right, and uh, this is the reason we are choosing only paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We are not doing persistent, of course. Uh, what I can tell you that all patients had a reduction, reduction on AF burden, but in, on the next study we are going to start also with uh, uh, mapping, uh, using external mapping. And uh, because sometimes this patient has a, a typical lateral flutter, so we will do this mapping as well before, uh, before ablation. But uh, you are I fully agree with you. Uh, these patients are sick patients and they have fibrosis out of pulmonary vein. They can do relapses. I fully agree with you. And uh, anybody has a question for the Carlo Papones talk? Yes. Um, I have a question. So I. I I've, I've done few Brugada cases, actually not few, two, um, that, and I found a similar finding that, that you found, um, but I don't have experience with the long QT or short QT syndrome as far as mapping and substrate, and, and I really I don't understand um, the relationship between the genetic and the phenotype, but um, I just want to ask you, um, do you, have you mapped patients with short QT syndrome? Not yet, because uh, it's a very rare condition, and the indication for mapping this patient is uh, the presence of a repetitive episode of ventricular fibrillation. So our experience in long QT is just focused on patient um, with recurrent ventricular fibrillation. So 30 patients are a lot of patients collected uh, in uh, four years, but uh, it's a relevant number. You know uh, how rare is the occurrence of ventricular fibrillation in long QT. But uh, this is what I found, so I'm not surprised that you don't have experience because uh, we had for serendipity the occasion to discover this type of substrate, but uh, during uh, more than uh, 1,000 mapping for Brugada. So it's understandable. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, talk. And um, I'm curious about uh, imaging because this is a very practical uh, meeting. And uh, I don't know if you are going to study also with the CT scan imaging because uh, CT scan is very able to find also fat and fibrosis. You found fibrosis. Probably may be interesting to do in these patients an imaging technique. What do you think? The present uh, CT technology is uh, unable to detect uh, this uh, microfibrosis uh, because uh, the, um, the dimension of this microfibrosis is a fraction of a millimeter. But uh, we just bought uh, a new technology of CT scan with a single photon, and uh, we have very high expectation that in the future with a single uh, with a CT scan, a single photon, will be possible to see in preview this type of substrate. We are very optimistic. In the near future, we will report our preliminary data. But actually, the MRI and the CT scan are unable to see that type of substrate, unfortunately. Thank and you. all our patients at the CT scan and MRI. Okay, thank you. So thank you. I give the microphone to Dan. Carlo, I have one more question, the last question for this session. Uh, I can imagine uh, how um, Brugada or early repolarization can be treated by localized ablation because this. Uh, this, uh, the changes on surface EKG are synchronous with pathological signals, but I can, can imagine how, um, how it, this can be used for treatment of long QT, because a long Q, a QT interval is sort of a far field look at, on a whole myocardium, and we are, uh, when you are treated only a small part of myocardium, I, I, I don't understand how, how, we can, uh, how this approach can shorten the QTC. Have you any idea uh, or hypothesis on also. pathological background? I don't know also, but I'm happy that we reduced the QT duration. 
I am happy. I did not understand why we get these results, but for sure we should look that uh, after the homogenization of this substrate, the patient did show any further episode of ventricular fibrillation. So for sure, the homogenization of the substrate was related to the occurrence of ventricular fibrillation and uh, arrhythmic storm. I don't think the ablation is deserved for the QT shortening of the patient, but just in case of very severe long QT condition. I have a few ideas regarding the mechanism of the shortening of QT. First of all, you know that the QT is not prolonged in the entire leads of the EKG. Uh, so if you look in detail the EKG of long QT patient, every individual patient has a different lengthness of QT uh, on the derivation. And there are preliminary studies showing that the morphology of torsided points is a, a typical morphology of uh, out right ventricular out through rut and uh, infralateral right ventricular activation. So I'm not surprised that we found the substrate in that region, but uh, one of the mechanisms of the QT uh, uh, shortening is due to the denervation of the autonomic system in that particular region. When we have a double potential and in the middle is electric line, probably that the, the isoelectric line is the region of insertion of the autonomic system. And probably the input of the anatomic, autonomic contribution in that region is much more than uh, that the input we have in other regions of the art. I understand how we can get uh, the shortening uh, ablating a very small region. I don't know, but this is one of the hypotheses.